Welcome to Horsepower Heritage. I'm Maurice Merrick. Today, I'm sitting with two guys who have probably forgotten more about air-cooled Porsches than I will ever know. First, Kevin Lynch is here. Hey, Kevin. Delighted to be here. Thank you. And then sitting next to Kevin, John Benton. Welcome to the podcast. Nice to see you. So, guys, I'm going to read to you an excerpt from the April 1965 issue of Car and Driver magazine. This is a road test of the new 911. No contest. This is the Porsche to end all Porsches, or rather, to start a whole new generation of Porsches. The new 911 model is unquestionably the finest Porsche ever built. More than that, it's one of the best GT cars in the world, certainly among the top three or four. Is that what started it for you guys? For sure, that era of car is what really got my heart singing. This was like a UFO landing in the middle of Nebraska, right? Rear engine, air-cooled. We have ad adopted this brand. Car enthusiasts in the U.S. are probably responsible for more Porsche sales in history than, than any other market, right? And For sure. And, and um, was it the styling? Was it the fact that you could see that this was through and through a sports car, or were you more curious about the technical aspects? Well, I, I grew up in Southgate, so you alluded to the fact that this was like a spaceship. So I grew up in a car culture that was hot rods, American muscle, with Keith Black and the GM plant. And uh, I grew up in a Chevy family, but we had Volkswagens too. So that was my first introduction to the whole air-cooled thing. And I was in love with air-cooled cars. I had a cousin who was a bug guy. And as he grew older, he purchased a Porsche. His first Porsche was a... 66 912 and I was a little kid and I gotta tell you that that was a mind bender because it had all the things that made a Volkswagen fun plus right and uh, I don't know what it was about it but it was very very fun and I gotta tell you I, I, I'm a car guy I like all kinds of stuff so I'm never gonna label myself as a Porsche guy per se but I, you know it's what I do I love it and it's my central focus but uh there is something different about them, not just you know the, the way the power plant is put together, whether it's mid engine or rear engine, and uh, very simple. You know, the cool thing about the 900 series cars, 912s and 911s, um, every time a car, you know, as you progress through the design and the engineering, things become simplified, and uh, you know, having worked on 356s and and Volkswagens, early Volkswagens, and and Porsche cars. The 901, it really, really is. I'm not simplification isn't a bad thing. It's a great thing. It's it's uh, efficiency in design, and and how you interact with the machine, is greatly affected by engineering. And they got it pretty darn good, pretty darn good. Uh, I, I always tell that uh, we were talking before uh, last week, and I I uh, I service other cars other than than Porsches, and I I worked on an Alpha for a client. And we went out to a thing, and I had told several people at this event because they're like, "What are you doing here?" And I said, "Well." I like Alphas, too, and my first sports car was an Alpha, a 59 Julietta. But when I got my 912, it eclipsed the driving experience in the Alpha so far that I was, I was blown away. I was blown away, and uh, it's, it's just different. And, and uh, to me, they're more reliable once they're dialed, and uh, they just tick all the buttons for me. Mid-century modern on wheels, classic styling, but with enough modern in there to make it usable today. I had a boss that owned an 81 911 SC, mm -hmm. I think. He lived in Huntington Beach, and he commuted to Hollywood every day. Mm -hmm. And the car had about 320-odd thousand miles on it. I mean, if Still that's... Like a horse. Yes. If <clears throat> that's not reliability, then tell me what is. That's well, right. The, that's S right. the SC variant is probably one of the best all-around cars still. It's an unsung hero. I think people talk about turbos and stuff, but... Still an incredible value, too, yes. for people wanting to get into the, the hobby. Mm -hmm. What an, an unbelievable entry point. I'll tell you about one that got away. About five years ago, I noticed a garage door open several blocks from my home, and inside was a mint green, I think, mm -hmm. a very light metallic green 911SC. There's a sort of an ice green color. Yes, was notable on the turbo, but they probably had a few that were in the SE. Paint rare to sample. Very rare bird, or, very rare bird yeah. actually. Beautiful color. It was fantastic. Yeah. And 
I was walking the dog at the time or something, so I couldn't be bothered to stop. But I should have because months went by, and then some. I saw a gentleman in the front yard, old, older gentleman, and I said, "Do you still have that Porsche 911?" He said, "Oh, that was my son's car. He sold it. It's in Germany now." Another repatriation. Yes, and so many. To so. your point about Porsche, and I don't have the facts to to back this up. I'm fairly certain the U.S. has been their largest export market forever. And within the U.S., California, forever. And within California, Orange County, forever. It only makes sense, right? This we, is an epicenter. We have right? 364 driving days a year. That's right. That's right. Tell me about what goes into tuning an air-cooled Porsche. And it doesn't matter if we're talking 356 or 911 or 912. I know they're all a little bit different. They all have a certain character, but when a customer comes to you and they want you to provide an integrated driving experience, prior to taping, we were we were talking about, I, I mentioned that too many people focus on powertrain and not on suspension and braking yeah. and other elements. Yeah, so, you know, I didn't go to college for this. I don't think there's a, a particularly a college for this, but... I didn't grow up in Orange County. I, I grew up in L.A. And, and uh, same. So, so we we're more like Maholland, you know, San Pedro, Angeles Crest, and ACH. You know, so we we drove those roads, and then I did some street racing. You know, the old GM plant over at Santa Fe and stuff. But I I uh, learned a lot about cars. You know, because when you lose control, you're like, whoa! I don't do that again. <laughs> But uh, as far as Porsches go, I always when when clients come in, I, I start I always start with tires, because tires are to me are fifty percent of the deal. So if you can afford good tires, you get the best tire you can that matches the car, and don't over tire. Agree with that. So brakes and handling, in the modern era, tires are can be really incredible, and they are, and that's where you start. By the way, how awesome is it that tires are so reliable now? Even 20 years ago, uh, a tire would not hold its pressure over, let's say, 45 days. Right. And now I can go six months without adding air to a tire. Plus a specialization that you can find, I mean, with certain size limitations, different compounds. I mean, it's, it's incredible what you can do to customize the drive yeah. using tires. I heard somewhere, and I don't, don't quote me, but I heard that Tires are the most technologically advanced part of an automobile or a motorcycle. Interesting. If you think about what the chemistry and the construction and everything yes. and the manufacturing process, all of those put together, you can see how slight improvements every... I mean, how often does a, ti a tire get improved? All the time, I bet they're making changes. Classic incremental. Yes, engineering. absolutely. Well, if, if you've experience a transition from a bias ply to a radial which i have done yes like i think pat long and i had a discussion about this let's have a racing series with bias ply only because that brings the don't lift scenario to a, another level um if you go back and look at a lot of vintage films like uh, there was a really good one in palm springs years ago at the vintage races uh you know a guy lifted in a 356 because somebody lost control and braked and man it hooked those bias plies and it's gone. Like, not just spinning out. I'm talking about... Airborne. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, so tires tires are your, your first big investment if you're, you want to start dabbling in higher performance. And it's relatively... In, I mean, for $600, you can change your driving experience. And then the next level is your suspension settings. So without doing a whole lot of crazy stuff, just get, let's talk about getting your settings correct. So, you know, caster, camber, um, toe, making little changes... It's it's a big huge, big deal. Huge, huge. Yeah, I I deal with people's uh, expectation within the area that they can deal with. You know what what they can deal with, you know dollars and cents, and I respect that. So some people come in and tires zip. We're gonna do tires, and we're gonna maybe do an alignment, and and they're they're totally happy because what they rolled in on was unacceptable, and so now they're feeling oh wow this is pretty nice. Some people just drop the car off. Like, I don't want to see the car till it has all this stuff. That's the other end of the spectrum. So they get to have another experience. You know, it is, it is this uh, journey from basic, simple adjustments to totally 
redefining the the underpinnings. Now, mind you, having said that, I'm also uh, I won't use this word about myself very often, but I'm conservative in some ways regarding what I'll do to a car, uh, unless we want to go to a different realm. But I really like honoring the original design. Um, the the stock components that these cars are designed with are generally just fine. But let's talk about the <clears throat> the suspension because I agree with John that it's about honoring the mark. But we've built some great cars together and are building a really interesting car now. But if I look at two 912s we've built together, one was the Irish, as it was called, perfectly stock. So a 1966 Stuttgart built, not Carmen built, three gauge, wonderful car. And when we were done, it was as if it had driven out of the factory that prior day. The Carmen built cars, Porsche farmed those out. They basically had a subcontract, right. not just to build the chassis, but to assemble the car. Because they did not have their own production capacity to do Correct. so. Correct. That's right. That's been, that's that been true of Porsche since a right. long It's time. actually not uncommon in Europe in right. general, sure. but sure. it's certainly the case sure. with Porsche. In the case of the 911 of that era, that was all built in Stuttgart. Okay. And the 912 was sort of the extra capacity. You have to take yourself back to 65, 66. Right. This was a big market change, six cylinders versus four. And the uptake rate, if you read all the history and spend time in their archives, you'll see that the uptake rate on the 911 was slow. Um, in many ways, people were concerned. Price was an issue. And so they had a lot of excess capacity. And the 912 would periodically fill that capacity. And then as more demand came, it would be bleed, bled out to Carmen. But this one particular car was a Stuttgart build, three gauge, beautiful car. Three gauge versus five gauge. Yes. So three gauge with classic Porsche, center large tachometer, absolutely a driver's car. To the right of that speedometer, sort of secondary importance, candidly, to a Porsche driver. And if you get accustomed to driving the car, you candidly know per gear what range you're generally in. To the left, a multi-purpose gauge in a three gauge, generally speaking, fuel levels and temperature. Right. Um, 904 series gets to three cells, even four cells in certain variants, but you know, we'll call that the information gauge. And it has a beautiful look and feel as a driver, really simple dashboard. And then, then there's painted dash cars, which oh. really harken back to- Take it to a whole nother level. Three, five, right? six, yeah. But that car was a oh. very stock, to John's point, absolutely per the factory spec suspension with a great set of Pirelli, um, very old school oh, waffle CN36s, tires on, CN36s. Yeah. So that drive, while very different, if I contrast it to the 1968 Bahama Yellow car that John and I built, often known as the Bahammer, hmm. um, more horsepower for sure, but not, not 2X, not a wholesale difference. Call it factory 92 to give or take 135. But in terms of suspension, front and rear sway bars, adjustable spring plates, very different upgraded brakes, far different in terms of the the struts. So a very different setup, but still honoring the mark. It was all feasible and available for a 1968 platform. And you drive the two cars, both are incredible driving experiences. And as a person that just loves cars, I mean, I do love Porsches, but I love all vintage cars. I appreciated the difference. One would sway a little more on a groove cut freeway and you know would swing a little more in a turn but once you put yourself in that seat and got accustomed to driving it unbelievable experience the other the behammer you almost i would argue become a worse driver with it because you can push it to such extremes and it really does not want to let go in the back i have two thoughts one is first of all irish if you picture the perfect 911 or 912 off the factory floor just come off the line, that was your car. For sure. For sure. It was amazing. Irish green, it's just a it's just a fitting color for that shape. Yes, it was amazing. It was an amazing car. Still is to this day. By the way, where is it now? So I get to see it almost every week. It's uh, a great friend and neighbor bought the car from me um, and made a, made a nice donation to our foundation at the same time. And then subsequently, as in weeks, took a job for his existing company, it took a, jo a job in Switzerland. And I tried so hard to convince him, take it with you. Drive this in the Alps. It Drive will be Alps, an man. unbelievable experience. And the Swiss you know, Transit Authority will actually accept it because it's stock.
but he was hell bent to make modifications. And John and I both pled with him, please at least put everything away so you can return it to stock. I mean, the Leistrance muffler on the back oh, of that car was hard so to hard to find. I mean, that was months and months, but beautiful. New old stock. Very, very Brand amazing. new, never on a car. Never on a car. Wow. So things like that are treasures, right? They're rolling treasures. But that car was uh, was amazing. And the the few modifications that have made to it are, are still make it a great car. Wouldn't be what I would do, but you have to appreciate that everyone has their taste. Well, people love to see the car still. And yeah. it's, you know, it's a canvas, right? People so you have to look at you have to look at that owner and say, it's your canvas now. And I appreciate what you want to do. You gotta it. let it go. But he's left the car in Southern California and another neighbor actually is the caretaker. And so it's maybe a dozen garages away. And I know the sound of it. Yeah, intimately. I know when it fires up. I know when it goes by the front door. And so I get to see it periodically. I built that car with John. And my I always have a build thesis. What am I trying to do? And I always have an intend, you know, intended use for the car. And the build thesis was clearly stock, factory, as mm -hmm. I would call it. And the intended use was actually my wife as a gift. So she was born in 1966. It's 1966. So same year. She has green eyes. It's Irish green. Yeah. I, I personally, and I think John shares this, I think these cars, at least for me, my you know, satisfaction, my desires are all satisfied when it gets down to that level of granularity and detail. I've heard people say it's all about the details. I agree with that. But for me, it's taking it to that last step. That's that canvas being fulfilled with your full design and painting, you know, getting the little details, the right switch knob, the right muffler, the right turn indicators, the right shift knob. And these things sometimes take, you know, months, if not longer, to find. I know it's not your favorite term, but when you curate them together as a build, there's a distinct difference between a car that's been restored or a car that's been modified and a car that's really had that final level of detail put to it. When you stand them side by side, you can see it. And to me, that's, that's called satisfaction. I look at some of the builds that we've done together and you know the the 6J by 15 Fuchs known as Deep 6 Fuchs on my Bahammer as an example. I found those on a moving blanket in a parking lot in Stuttgart in December with a light snow. A, a, a man that was restoring them did a few sets every few months. I was there visiting the museum and the archives. Porsche was incredibly kind and set me up with a translator and a desk to work at for a few days. And I was taking some time from work. And I happened to get out of the car that was taking me back to my hotel and walk just an extra few blocks in the wrong direction. It was pre-Christmas and I saw a little bazaar slash what we would call sort of parking lot sale going on. And in the middle of all that and all the trinkets and things I wasn't interested in is this man selling perfectly restored, anodized, painted, Fuchs to perfect spec. And so, yeah, was it ordained to happen? Absolutely. I will tell you. Absolutely it was. Absolutely. And aside from the price, which was actually really attractive for me, there was a certain amount of joy standing there and talking with this guy about his passion for doing this. And then the grand leap of faith on humanity where you hand him money and say, I will buy these. And here's my address. And please ship them to Southern California. And you walk away thinking... I either have the greatest thing in the world that's going to go on my car, or I am the biggest rube that's ever landed on the, on the ground. The mere fact that you can tell that story instead of saying, yeah, I, I clicked a couple buttons on a website and right. I got my wheels in two days. Big yeah. deal, right? Well, it's, it's, about, it's experiential. And they showed up in boxes, and the level of care in the packing, I wish I'd taken pictures. And each box had a package of gummy, uh, the little gummy bears. Yes, the German or Swiss version of it. Sure. And a little note saying, I hope you enjoy the wheels. Fantastic. So it's a story, and all those stories come together um, in a car. We'll be right back with more Horsepower Heritage. Don't go away. <laughs> <laughs> 